Now turn to Section 1 of your booklet. Section 1. Listen to the telephone conversation between a student and the owner of a paragliding school and answer the questions 1 to 7. Now you have some time to read questions 1 to 7. Hello. Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? We... we've got the introductory course, which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course. There's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is what you'd probably be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, although there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with the family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? Yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 2492, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually, there is. It's 0249, that is for Newcastle, and then 760412. OK. Now, if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? By credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa, Master and American Express. OK, then. Thanks very much. Now you have some time to read questions 8 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here... Clothes wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills, preferably a long-sleeved T-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. Water is really the best thing to drink. We'd also need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. OK, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way we'd save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Um, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. 
Hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. Okay, let's do it. What about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before exams, and I really need to study. Okay, then. Let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and. This is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a talk about a pool and outdoor venue created by some people. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hey, if you're just joining us on WKPX The Sound, welcome. We're here in the studio with Matt and Cam in the morning, and this morning we're talking about keeping the kids occupied on summer vacation. Folks, there's a new kid in town in the world of summer fun. Get ready for the pool of the people a pool and outdoor venue created by, that's right, the people. Scheduled to open in November, the ideas for everything from the design of the pool right down to the items sold in the snack bar have been decided upon by a sample of 1,050 members of the public. The public selected two top proposals from over a dozen created by renowned architect Ned Mosby, and the final design is truly something else. The pool is shaped like a fishbowl, sinking down into the ground. And there's, you guessed it, a real live fish tank in the center. It's certainly the center of attention in the Bridgewater area. Now, you are probably wondering how much an extravagance like this must cost, right? Well, have no fear. At just £15 for adults and £10 for kids, it's an affordable way to entertain the kids in those dog days of summer. The only problem now is the possibility that it will in fact become too popular. The pool is only so large, so swarms of people coming to enjoy it may cause quite a crowd in its first summer of opening. There will be an opening party for a select audience, and in line with the pool's mission, the people have decided on all the arrangements. They collectively decided on actress Rebel Wilson to host in the festivities scheduled for later this month and even dictated the playlist by ranking their top 10 songs from a list of hundreds. There is some discrepancy, however, on the sculpture design for the foyer at the entrance. The people elected a jellyfish sculpture to greet entering visitors, but given last week's vicious attack by a box jellyfish on a local youth, coordinators fear it will bring too much fear to patrons. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. The theme of the clubhouse is set to be International Waters, 
with a different section representing each continent, designed by the legendary local artist Roberta Anuzzi. Representing Asia in the reception area will be a mosaic made up of prominent animals indigenous to the continent, a camel, a panda, and the Siberian white tiger, to name just a few. In the West Lounge, feel the cool, icy vibes of the Transantarctic Mountains of Antarctica. Makes you cold just thinking about it, doesn't it? Just seeing a wall with a mural of the glacial mountains is almost enough to cool you off on a December afternoon. Almost. Why not make the trip to the pool a social studies lesson at the same time? The theme in the ladies' lounge room for Africa may not be what you expected. A safari? Drum music? The Nile River? No. Did you know that Africa was home to the first jewellery? I sure didn't. By contrast, as you may expect, North America's theme for the card room is as modern, even futuristic, as it gets. Anuzzi created for North America a sort of absurdist print, interestingly juxtaposing the moon landing of 1969 with an abstract depiction of humans living on Mars. Seems to me like an interesting commentary on the future of space exploration. And in the men's lounge room, the ancient forts of Sparta, Rome, Greece and other European civilizations fittingly exhibit the strength and combatant characteristics of these societies. Finally, the cafe and breakfast room area is an enchanting round room that draws all attention to its centre, where there is a strikingly realistic sculpture of a volcano. The delicious food may actually be only the second most exciting part of this room in comparison to the nine-foot statue complete with brightly coloured molten lava to characterise South America. Honestly, it is like a museum visiting each room of the clubhouse. Why not make the trip to the pool an educational one for the kids? We're going to take a quick commercial break here at WKPX. But we'll be back in 10 with more on what's touted to be the summer's hottest place to beat the heat. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. In a moment, you are going to hear a conversation between a professor and his student, Alicia. As you listen, answer questions 21 to 30. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now, listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Section 3 Until recently, we knew almost nothing about how important bees are in maintaining natural diversity. Now we know more about them. We know, for example, that bees fall into two categories wild bees and domesticated honeybees. A main reason for the domestication of bees has always been the production of honey and beeswax. We also know that honeybees are the dominant pollinators. In addition to bees, wasps, moths, butterflies, flies and beetles, as many as 1,500 species of bird and mammals serve as pollinators. Many crops of commercial importance, such as almond, cherry, 
avocado pear, watermelon, cucumber, rely on pollination by insects, and of these insects, bees are by far the most important. Animals and insects provide pollination services for over three quarters of the stable crop plants, and for eighty percent of all flowering plants in the world. The economic value of animal pollinators to world agriculture has been estimated to be two hundred billion U.S. dollars per year. Pollination is one of nature's services to farmers, so think about this: if you eliminated the pollinators. It would take the food right out of our mouths. We biologists never imagined we'd see the day when wild plants or crops suffered from pollinator scarcity, but unfortunately, that day has come. In fact, farmers in Mexico and the U.S. are suffering the worst pollinator crisis in history. So, what happened? Any ideas? Alicia, it is um because of natural enemies. I read something about a kind of parasite that's killed lots of bees. It's true. An outbreak of parasitic mites has caused a steep decline in North American populations of honeybees, but parasites aren't the only factor. What about the pesticides used on farms? All those chemicals must have an effect. Most definitely, yes. Pesticides are a major factor. Both wild and domesticated bees are in serious trouble because of pesticides. In California, farm chemicals are killing around ten percent of all the honeybee colonies. Agriculture in general is part of the problem. Another example is the monarch butterfly. Millions of monarchs from all over the U.S. and southern Canada fly south every year in late summer. The monarch is the only butterfly that returns to a specific site year after year. Unfortunately, the herbicides used in the milkweed in the Great Plains are taking a toll on monarchs. And fewer of them are reaching their winter grounds in Mexico. In a recent field study at Cornell University in the U.S., it was found that monarch butterfly caterpillars eating corn toxic pollen blown onto milkweed plants near cornfields had suffered significant adverse effects, leading to death of nearly 20 percent of the caterpillars. Wow, twenty percent! That's so tragic. And it's more than that. There are over one thousand five hundred species of butterflies in the Indian subcontinent, but their population is dwindling because of environmental changes. Many man-made environmental changes, like deforestation, extension of farming, and unrestricted urbanization. Are threatening some species of butterflies to extinction by destruction or disturbance of their larval as well as adult food plants, feeding grounds, and shelters. Many of the most spectacular and endangered species have various levels of protection under local legislation. However, there is a major trade in the spectacular tropical species. For incorporation in ornaments and souvenirs, the international demand for insects is greater than most people realize. Yes, indeed. I once read an article about another important pollinator, the long-nosed bat. These amazing animals feed on cactus flowers, but they are having a tough time too. Some desert ranchers mistake them for vampire bats. And they've tried to poison them, or dynamite the caves where they roost. Yes, we must recognize that pollination is not a free service, and that investment and stewardship are required to protect and sustain it. So, what can be done about this situation? Well, wildlife farming, you know, 
based on sustainable exploiting wild creatures, can help to save endangered species like butterflies and their habitats. Besides, gardeners, orchard growers, farmers, and urban dwellers can switch to more pollinator-friendly organic methods of cultivation to reduce wildlife exposures to insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. That's right. Actually, the focus on beekeeping needs to change from conventional honey production to crop pollination. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer in Australia on a type of bird called a peregrine falcon. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 8 and 9. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm Professor Sam Richards and I've come as the third guest lecturer on this course in Australian Birds of Prey. My job is to keep a watchful scientific eye on the state of Tasmanian peregrines. So I'll start by giving you some background to these magnificent birds of prey before I speak briefly on my own project. Peregrine falcons are found on all continents with the exception of Antarctica, so don't go looking for them at the South Pole. They're found almost everywhere in Australia, and it's interesting to note that the name peregrine implies that they're wanderers, that they move from place to place following the seasons, and indeed in most parts of the world they're migratory birds. But not in Australia, however, where they prefer to stay in one place. They're known to be the world's fastest creature, and they have been tracked by radar diving down towards the ground at 180 kilometres an hour. However, a number of textbooks claim that their flight speed can go as high as 350 kilometres an hour, so there's still some dispute about just how fast they can actually fly. Female peregrine falcons, like all other Australian falcons, are larger than their male counterparts. In fact, the female is almost a third larger than the male in the case of peregrines. While she stays close to the nest to protect the eggs and the young chicks, the male is mostly occupied looking for food. Peregrines typically lay two or three eggs per nest, and after the eggs have hatched, when the chicks are about 20 days old, they start to fly. So they fly at a very young age. By the time they're just 28 days old, they've already reached full adult size. In other words, they're fully grown. Soon after this, at about two months after hatching from the egg, they leave the nest for good. From this point on, they're on their own. Unlike their parents, which have learned how to hunt, the young falcons are not good at feeding themselves, and so during the first year, about 60% of them die. Once the birds have managed to live to breeding age, at two years old, they generally go on to live for another six or seven years. When we come across nests with young chicks, the first thing we do is catch the chicks before they're able to fly. We have to catch them at an early age. We then attach identification rings to their legs. These rings are made of colour-coded aluminium. 
and they allow us to identify the birds through binoculars later in their lives. Thirdly, because we need to know how many males and how many female chicks are being born, we note the sex of the chicks. Noting the sex of the birds is a vital part of our research, as I will discuss later. The next thing to do is to take a blood sample from the chicks. We take the blood sample so that we can check the level of pesticide in their bodies. Peregrine falcons can build dangerous quantities of pesticides in their bloodstream by feeding on smaller mammals, which in turn feed on crops grown on farms where pesticides are used. Finally, we check the birds thoroughly, really checking the birds for their general health. This whole process only takes a few minutes. In fact, most of our time in the field is actually spent trying to find the nests, not on the data collection itself. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you'd like to do some further reading... That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.